receive our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the Let's remain standing as we open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for, for just being our Savior, Lord, and allowing us, Lord, to, to come here today, allowing us to worship you through song, Lord, and allowing you to, to work in our hearts, God. And I pray, Lord, that we will do that today, Lord, allow you to do a great work in us, Lord, through us, Lord, to, to fulfill your prophecies, Lord, to fulfill what you want us to do. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you will use us. Lord, help us to be clean vessels today. Pray, Lord, that you will be with the services, be with the congregation. Lord, come down and be with us, as I know you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to move on now to the books of the Bible. Books of the Bible. We're going to start with the Old Testament. We're going to say it all the way through, then we're going to go to the New Testament. Starting with the Old Testament, all together. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Amen. On to the New Testament, starting with Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelations. Amen. Amen. It's all 66 books. We're going to move on now to our verse journal, verse of the week, which is Psalms, chapter 23, verse 5. First, we're going to start off with you repeating after me. Then we're going to say it all together, and we're going to see if we can have two people say it from memory. So repeat after me. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. All together now. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. 
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. Do we have two? Jamari. Amen. We have one more this morning. One more. One once. Mr. Brown? for tonight for our verse journals. I believe we are doing that tonight. So we are doing it tonight. So there's no confusions. Ushers, if you please come forward. Brother Anderson, if you can pray for our offering this morning. reminds me. We can uh, double check our cell phones and make sure they're powered off, muted, out the auditorium. That'd be great. At this time, we're going to prepare to pray for our missionaries. Um, Mr. Murray, can you pray for our missionaries this morning?
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this day. Lord, we pray for preachers in Chicago. Um, Lord, we just pray for preachers. Um, uh, just give out the gospel. Lord, are just willing to accept your call. Lord, preachers that um, are able to withstand this world. Lord, um, they have their trust in you. Lord, we pray for for preachers, Lord, that have your word written on their heart. I pray for preachers that understand they can't um, do anything without your power. Or preachers that want to see souls saved. Or preachers that want to preach your word. Um, Lord, so that um, believers Lord, can grow better for you. Lord, we thank you for um, the young men that have already accepted your call, Lord, the ones that have already responded to your call for them to preach, Lord, we pray that you would um, uh, just nurture them, Lord, give them wisdom, Lord, um, lead them in the way that you want them to go. We pray for laborers in Chicago, pray for laborers, um, Lord, as the harvest is ready, Lord, we need more laborers um, to sow, we need more laborers to reap. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord. Help us to have a zeal and have a burden for lost souls in our own city. Lord, pray that you would just continue to bring laborers and preachers in Chicago. Pray that we honor you, worship you, and glorify you in everything we do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. This is session 26. This is our Evangelism Emphasis Sunday, session number 26 in our conference on the subject of evangelism. And this brings us back to the book of Nehemiah where we have been studying. And I would like everyone that has access to a copy of God's Word, a Bible, to turn to the book of Nehemiah. And as we apply Nehemiah's life to our evangelism efforts, our soul winning efforts in Chicago, I see in our efforts a wall that we have spent the last eight days, including today, seeking to repair and to restore, rebuild and reinforce. And so that's what we're going to continue to do today is that theme of reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and needy world. Something that was said during the conference that really spoke to my heart is that God puts that desire in a heart when a person is saved to want to reach the lost. And you can know whether or not you're saved by that test right there. There, if a person has no concern for other people learning the gospel of Jesus Christ and becoming born again in him, if there's no desire for that, then that's not salvation. But saved people have a burden for the lost. And so we're going to look at Nehemiah today and see his example in soul winning. Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. When you get to Nehemiah chapter 5, the text passage is verses 12 through 19. 12 through 19. We'll read those verses as we go through the lesson, but for purposes, if you're taking notes or marking your Bible, the text for today's lesson is chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. Nehemiah, of course, we've learned this, was a wall builder. But the more I read his life, the more I see he was also a great example. And I want to say today an example of a soul winner. You've learned something about the character of Nehemiah as we've gone through these messages. If Nehemiah were a member of Cornerstone Baptist Church... I believe with all my heart he would have been out there with us yesterday 
as we knocked on doors and as we preached the gospel on the street corner, I have no doubt that Nehemiah, if he were a member of our church, would have been among us yesterday. Again, we're spending these eight full days repairing the wall of our witness. Repairing the wall of our witness. And as we've looked at the book of Nehemiah, we have seen a man that was very concerned about a community in ruins. He saw this community in ruins. He heard about it. He got burdened about it. Does it burden you to see a community in ruins? Does it affect your heart as you pass by and see a community broken? Well, Nehemiah decided to pray about it. And the answer to that prayer was full permission, full privilege, and full resources to go back to Jerusalem and to see to it that the wall was rebuilt. He got there. He didn't start building right away. According to the word of God, Nehemiah took some time to inspect, to size up the job. And then he got to the work of building. There came a point in time, if you remember, while building, that they had to defend themselves. They had to band together, be willing to fight, and they had to have a sword in one hand, a trowel in the other, a weapon in one hand, a building tool in the other, and they had to set a watch. But they kept on building, so they didn't get sidetracked away from the main goal. While they were building, they saw much rubble. They saw things in the way that stood in the way, debris that had to be picked up, gathered up, taken out of the way so that the wall could be built properly. And as is always the case when you try to do something for God, there was opposition. We saw, just like life, just like Christianity, we saw opposition from without, Sanballat, Tobiah, and others. And then we saw very quickly after they got back to the work that there was opposition from within. Opposition from without, opposition from within. When the opposition came from within, from Jew on Jew crime, Jew on Jew mistreatment, Nehemiah called a big meeting and he rebuked those that were extorting their fellow brethren. And he got in their face. He had a meeting and he said, stop it. Just like I'm saying to some of you young people back there that are talking, stop it, pay attention. But he got those people together. He said, stop robbing your brethren and cheating your brethren and charging your brethren interest. Stop. He rebuked them for it because they were wrong. What was their response when they were told about themselves and how they were financially mishandling their own people? What was their response? Our text today picks up right there at the response. And we're going to see some things that I believe we can apply directly to our work of evangelism or soul winning. Number one, when we make a decision to do what's right, we need accountability. When we make a decision to do what's right, we need accountability. You say, why? Because we're human. You say, why? Because we're made of clay. You say, why? Because we're, we are our brother's keeper. And as much as we like to think of ourselves as being independent, we have a need to be kept accountable by other people who want to go in the same direction as us. What was the response when they were rebuked? Look at verse number 12 with me. Please look at the Bible. Verse number 12. Then said they, we will restore them. Okay, they're going to give it back. And we'll require nothing of them. We're going to stop charging them. We're going to do what you said, Nehemiah. So will we do as thou sayest. So what did Nehemiah do? Look at the text. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Now, the response was good. Nehemiah had wisely told the truth. 
Nehemiah had rebuked them when they needed it. They, they were confronted by this man of God. He spoke the truth in love. They received the rebuke. They said they would stop cheating. But what did Nehemiah do after they said they would do things right? Somebody raise their hand and tell me where you see accountability here. Amanti? He called the priests. Do you see that in verse 12? He made them take a what? Oath that they should do according to this promise. He made them accountable. Why? Didn't they make a good decision? Yes. Didn't they have good intentions? Yes. Pastor Lewis, do you think their motives were right? Yes. But he made them still accountable. How can we be the right soul winners at Cornerstone Baptist Church as members if we have no built-in accountability to help each other continue to go in the direction of building the wall? If you are a member here and you're involved in the ministries of the church, we have a requirement that at least once a week you go out in some capacity, and there's several at this church, many capacities, that you go out in some kind of way to try to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost people. And if you're in a ministry, you sign an agreement that you believe like we believe, that we have a responsibility, and that it doesn't make sense for you to stand on this platform and have everybody look at you when you sing or pray or preach if you're not living out the Great Commission in your everyday life. And so we have accountability. And as the pastor, if I feel that you're not regular in your soul winning, I may come to you and say, hey, friend, have you been going out soul winning? I'm talking to the members of the church in active ministry. We have men's and ladies accountability groups. And I don't know exactly, uh, um, exactly how things are going with the ladies, but I know how it is with the men. We're contacting each other during the week if we're doing what we're supposed to do. And we're asking questions that point back to our walk with God and even our thought life and our strongholds. And we believe that accountability is essential to standing. And so even if you make a good promise, a good decision, that thing will in, in, in many cases go nowhere if you don't feel some accountability. And Nehemiah made them accountable. We have some staff members that help work in our church, work in our office, work in our school. You need to be kept accountable. In God's work, do according to your promise. Do according to your promise. Number two, God's workers should stay in the lap. God's workers, you say that sounds odd, I agree. God's workers should stay in the lap. Christian, are you in the lap? Look at verse number 13. Also, I shook my what? Okay, we need our Bibles. Let's look on. Verse number 13. Also, I shook my lap and said, God, so God, shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. The Bible says that Nehemiah, he did something that in our culture is kind of odd. Uh, he shook his lap. And he said, the same way I've done this, so God shake every man out of his house and from the labor of this wall that doesn't keep the promise. Shake him out. Shake him out of that. I don't know what Nehemiah took. I'm sure he was wearing some kind of a robe. And maybe he had some grain in his lap on his robe. But he had something there. And, and some type of an object lesson. He shook it out. And he said, God shake you out of your house. God shake you out from this work. If you don't perform your promise. Those who would not follow the Lord were symbolically shaken out through this act, and no doubt it would happen very truly 
if they broke their promise. Can I ask you a question? Who else does God have to shake out of this house? Who else does God have to shake out of the lap? I'm talking about church discipline. You can't go soul winning with us if you're not in the lap. There are people over the, the years, sadly, that have been shaken out of the lap. Do you think they went out soul winning with us yesterday? No. I don't know what they did yesterday. I don't know where they were, but I know they weren't a, a part of that 40 or so that went out yesterday. Why? They got shook out the lap. So let me encourage you. Stay in the lap. Number three, Nehemiahs don't serve for money. Nehemiahs don't serve for money. Look at verse number 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, that tells us how long he was there as governor, 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Somebody tell me what that means. I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Crystal. Okay, so the governor had a salary that was due to him. And Nehemiah said, I didn't take it. I forewent my salary to serve as governor. He said, I'm not serving for a paycheck. He was a great example of putting the work of God ahead of his own personal interest. He certainly had the right to tax the people for his support. It was the governor's salary. He was the governor. He was entitled to that paycheck. But he didn't claim that right because it would not help the work of God. We need to turn cell phones off in church. We need to turn them off. He did not claim the governor's salary because it would not help the work of God. Can you think of a New Testament example today of a man in the New Testament who had the right to be supported but oftentimes did not exercise that right so that the work of God could go forward. Can you think of a New Testament example? Amante. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's all turn. Keep your place in Nehemiah 5. But go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul said, as a full-time minister, a full-time preacher, I had a right to be supported by the churches that I was preaching to, but I didn't always exercise that right because I didn't want to hurt the gospel effort in that place. So sometimes he made tents. He didn't always claim this right because it was better for the cause of the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Verse number one, what does the Apostle Paul say, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 9, 1, he says, am I not an apostle? That's a question. What's the answer to that question? Now, that was weak. The, the, the apostle, I just gave you the answer. The Apostle Paul asked a question in verse number one. Am I not an apostle? It's a rhetorical question. What's the answer? Yes, he is an apostle. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Did he not see him? Where did he see him? On the road to Damascus. Are not ye my work in the Lord? He's saying, didn't I give you the gospel? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. He says to the church, you're the proof that I'm an apostle. Okay? He, Paul said, God used me to plant the church. You're the proof that God called me. Verse number three, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Apostle Paul saying, don't I have the power to eat 
and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, that's proof the apostles could be married, contrary to the Roman Catholic Church? Paul said he had the liberty to have a wife if he was led to have a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? What does he mean by that? Don't we have the power to not have to work a secular job? Don't we have that right to forbear working a secular job? We're serving the church full time. Verse 7. Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Do you know any uh, uh, soldiers in our country that go to war and they're not paid? They, 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 have, they have compensation for that. Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Do you know anybody that plants grapes and doesn't pop a few in his mouth every once in a while? Okay. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Is it just for animals, is what he's saying? Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? What's Paul saying there? I'll read it again, verse number 12. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Jamari thinks he knows it. No, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> uh, Julian. <laughs> he should be confiscated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, by God's grace, we were able to give Pastor Whitaker and Brother Cloud a very generous love offering. Yeah. You say, why did you do that? Why did you give them a generous love offering? Well, they preach nine times, each, <laughs> each. And, and verse number 11, if, if they have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if, if they should reap your carnal things? Okay. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather, nevertheless, we have not used this power. For this church, that power wasn't used. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Now, verse 14 seals the deal. How many of you have ever heard of Geno Jennings? Okay. Uh, that man, he is bold, and he's a heretic. Say, I like the fact that he's bold. He believes something. But he believes that you can lose your salvation. And he also believes that preachers should not be supported by their churches. But verse 14 says very clearly, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Yeah, it's clear. Support of those in full-time ministry. Verse 15, But I, the apostle says this, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be done so unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. And so should pastors and full-time Christian workers be supported today? That's the question. And here's the answer. It's all a question of what is better for the gospel in that place. If it is better for a preacher to be able to devote himself full-time to preaching ministry, full-time to pastoring, full-time to that ministry, then he should be taken care of by that ministry. He should be supported. But if it is not best for that church, for the gospel's sake, if it is not best 
for the gospel effort for that man to be supported, then he shouldn't be supported. Let me give you an example. When this church started, there were no people. There were no people. And all we had were visitors. Okay, the first few Sundays we had five, six, seven people, and we didn't know the next Sunday if those would be the same people. There were no members. They were all visitors. We started from scratch. I knew Portia would be there, and I knew one-year-old Lois would be there. Didn't know if anybody else was coming. And so I did not take a salary from the church. That was my, dis whatever came in the love offerings, whatever came in the regular offerings, I, I, I didn't accept a penny of it. Why? because it didn't make sense to. It didn't make sense to. It would have hurt this church from ever getting off the ground. In its infancy, I felt, I felt at least, to not do that. And so for the first several years, I did not draw a salary. You say, how did you live? Well, we prayed and we asked other churches to support us, just like missionaries do today. And we said, support us temporarily until the church can take us on as its first missionary. And that's what we did. And so the time came where the offerings started to grow, regular people started to come, Rachel's here, and so I started to take $50 a week. That was my salary, $50 a week. And uh, I remember Sean saying, I don't know anybody in their right mind that would do all of that for $50 a week. He said, I wouldn't. And, um, but, but listen, it was best for the gospel's sake here. I didn't want to hinder this church. I wanted this church to make it. You understand what I'm saying? And so we did what we had to do. And as the offerings went up, my support went down. And churches started sending letters saying, we're done supporting you. Hope you can make it. And then we had to trust God. And from that time, the Lord has used this church to take care of us. Nehemiah said, I'm going to do this the same way. Nehemiah said, watch me now, I already have a good salary as the king's. I don't need to double dip and take the governor's salary too. So he didn't. This example can be applied to winning the loss. Nehemiah wasn't there to fleece the people. He was there to serve the people. And so when we go out to witness, remember we're servants. We're servants, and we're there to serve them, not take from them. Verse number 15, but the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people. What did the old governors do? They took, they took that salary, okay, and had taken of them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I. Why? The Bible tells us. Because of the fear of God. Nehemiah said, I fear God too much to fleece God's people. Kenneth Copeland is a charismatic heretic. He is thought of today as the world's richest preacher, the world's richest pastor. He's worth $750 million and he preaches a false gospel. He's like one of these governors. And I'm saying we need to be like Nehemiah's. And so Nehemiah wasn't in it for the money. If you see a preacher that's in it for the money, run! Number four, a Nehemiah will stay focused on the work. Look at verse number 16. Yea, also I what? Oh, we're going to do better than that. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah sees the greedy governors. He doesn't take the governor's salary. What did he do next? Nehemiah chapter 5, verse number 16. Yea, also I, what? Continued in the work of this wall. Neither bought we any land. He wasn't there to invest. And all my servants were gathered thither, unto the work. So what was the big problem? It was a Wednesday night. Several of you were not here on that Wednesday night, but what was the big problem that, that Nehemiah confronted head on? What was the big problem? Somebody raise their hand and tell me what was the problem? What was the Jew on Jew crime? Crystal? 
Usury, charging them interest. Brothers, charging each other interest. What did Nehemiah do about it? This teaching time. What did Nehemiah, he saw it. What did Nehemiah do about it? I got the same person, people raising their hands. Come on now. What did Nehemiah do about it? Trinace. He stopped them and said, give it back. And they did with accountability. And then right after that, verse number 16 says he got back to the work. After dealing with the problem in the ministry, he went right back to work. Hear me, leaders for God, and I'm looking at leaders for God right now, will learn to deal with the problems of ministry, face them head on, but then get right back to work. We've had church discipline issues. We've had things that could have distracted us from the goal, but before the Lord, what we have tried to do as a body is say, yes, we need to deal with that, but then we need to get right back to work. Amen. That's Nehemiah. They stay focused on the work. And our great work is preaching the gospel to every creature. You say, what is the gospel? It is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. Hey, why get distracted? And, and by, by the gossips, by the church discipline issues, get all frustrated and then the church just dies because we, we dealt with the problem and we dwelled on the problem too long and never got back to the work of getting lost people under the sound of the gospel. He died for you. I'm thinking of the problems right now that we've gone through. But I want you to know he died for you. He was buried for you. And, and watch me. He arose again from the dead on the third day for you. And we can let nothing distract us from that work. There was a great group out yesterday that came out to go soul winning. Will you be like Nehemiah? Look at verse 16. I want you to see that word continued. Is that going to be you? Is that going to be you? Number five, Nehemiah leaders are generous to others. Nehemiah leaders are generous to others. Look at verse number 17. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers, beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. How many people sat at Nehemiah's table to eat on a regular basis? According to verse number 17. 150. How did he feed them? Out of his own I have no doubt that Nehemiah was a wealthy man he was the cupbearer to the king and he not only not only did he not take from them he gave to them he did not just say I'm not going to fleece them he extended his hand generously listen to me soul winner he understood the power of generosity and fellowship Gathering these people at his own table. Soul winner, who can you help that's hurting today? We've seen things in our body. People have been hurt. Why should they listen to you preach Jesus to them if you shut up your bowels of compassion when they have an earthly need? If we're going to be good soul winners, we need to listen to me. At times, if there's no food in that house, go get a bag of groceries. Compassion over their temporal needs. Verse number 18. Now that which was prepared for me. Look at how much food Nehemiah had on his table on a daily basis. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep. How many of you like venison? Or lamb chops? Also fowl were prepared for me. And once in ten days store all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor. Because the bondage was heavy upon this people. Upon this people. Nehemiah said, I've got all this food. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to share it with others. Now you listen to me. Hear me well. Those of you that named the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will not bless a stingy Christian. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say it again because we hold on tight. We hold on tight and we stay with that and then that's gone. God will not bless a stingy Christian. 
And God kept on blessing Nehemiah. You say, why? He kept on giving. He kept on giving. This verse showed us that as a worker for God, he shared what he had. Who could you have over to your house for a meal? Not a buddy. Not, not, a, not a, 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 a continual attender at the church that you like. But how about that newcomer to the church that you could sit down with and break bread with and continue to share Christ? And then number six, Nehemiah sought praise from God. He sought praise from God. Verse number 19, please look at that verse in the Bible. He says, think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Now, some people think that Nehemiah was wrong for what he said in verse number 19, that he was wrong for saying that he had done all of these good things and that he wanted God's blessing because of it. Jesus plainly said in the New Testament that we should not do things outwardly to be seen of men. But in this prayer, Nehemiah isn't looking for praise from man. He's looking for praise from God as a faithful man. In fact, Nehemiah probably intended for no one to read his writings as he wrote it as a diary. But God had other purposes in mind. Listen, in our own private time with the Lord, if you are busy working for the Lord and not just warming a pew, if you're serving the Lord, it is entirely appropriate to say, God, think upon me for good according as I have done for your people. Right. Yeah. Nehemiah, will you go out soul winning with us today? Absolutely. What time are you guys leaving? Do we have enough tracks? If we don't, I'll get some. I'll put it together. Let's go. Nehemiah is a good example of what we should see in a soul winning. We're going to close for prayer. We've got 10 minutes before the morning service. If you need a drink of water or a restroom break, you can take care of that. At 1030 sharp, our main service will begin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of a Christian worker we see in Nehemiah. Help us to go and do likewise. In Jesus' name, amen.